When I first tried the Daily Tech News Show with Tom Merritt and his insightful commentary, it was so good I told two friends about it. And, and they, they told, told two friends, friends and, and so on, and, and so on, and, and so on. And believe me, it's so easy to donate to DTNS. Head over to patreon.com slash A-C-E-D-T-E-C-T. Then tell your friends about it. And they'll tell two friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, June 2nd, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me from Finland this time, Patrick Beja, independent podcaster and DTNS contributor. How fares the world of Finland? Um, so, you know, it's, it's good. I try to only join DTNS when I'm in countries that begin with an F. Um, so yeah. I was in Russia last week, and you're but like, nope. I didn't know nope, I couldn't do it. Although it's the Federation of Russia, technically you could have. I suppose so. Yeah. Darn it. Merit, get your time machine out. We have to redo the episode. How was, how was Russia? It was very interesting. I was in St. Petersburg, which is probably the most Western city in all senses <laughs> of the word. And uh, it was very interesting. Technologically, it was a little bit more <laughs> a little bit more advanced than I thought it would be. They had uh, Wi-Fi everywhere. Everyone had phones, including lots of iPhones. Um, but the biggest technological surprise actually came from Finland, where we were looking for a... Uh, wireless connection and one of the easiest solution was actually mobile uh, subscriptions and even uh, data prepaid data cards uh, if I'm correct where f for the subscription for example you can get an unlimited uh, 100 megabits connection for about twenty dollars a month so Quite there bad. you go unlimited mm -hmm. too unlimited wow. no data cap and and well, my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law was really pissed because on his plan that was a little bit cheaper. They limited uh, the the data. That he has a data cap of about seventy gigabytes mm -hmm. a month, and he was really angry. That was unacceptable. So seventy gigabytes. How can I live with just <laughs> seventy gigabytes? Oh my gosh! I had a giga I had a gigabyte cap on my prepaid card in Italy for a week, and I felt like a like I was living in luxury. That's uh, Finland for you. Uh, that's crazy. Uh, well, you can say "Spasiba to Ekaterina" for Saint Peter Saint Petersburg, because uh, it's uh, she she was the empress who really kind of put that city westernized. Yeah, she very much western. She tried to emulate France, as a matter of mm -hmm. fact. As, Always a good choice yeah. in my book. Well, enough of my uh, half attempts at history. <laughs> Let's listen to some headlines. TechCrunch has confirmed that Microsoft has indeed acquired productivity app Wunderlist. The company that created Wunderlist 6 Wunderkinder has more than 13 million users. CEO Christian Reber said, for now, nothing will change, although new features and partner integrations are likely. Uh, and it's an example of Microsoft continuing to grab apps in the productivity space. So... Yeah, they're on the roll. Yeah, smart smart move for Microsoft. Probably. You know, I'm a big fan of Wonderlist, by the way. Veronica Belmont, huge fan. I think of e I think everyone is a big fan of Wonderlist. I used it for, for a while me. and then I stopped. Mm. And I don't it's, have a good uh, reason why I stopped. I just stopped. <laughs> it has fans, who are now automatically fans of Microsoft. Oh, so that's oh. an interesting situation. So what you're saying is Veronica Belmont, huge fan of Microsoft. That ex is exactly what I'm saying. The Verge reports the first products to work with Apple's HomeKit are here. HomeKit allows smart home products to be controlled by any iOS device. Lutron's $230 lighting kit and Insteon's Smart Home Hub go on sale today. Echobee's $250 thermostat, iHome's power outlet and Elgato sensors will go on sale in July. HomeKit was announced one year ago today. So they're sliding in just under the mark to be able to say at WWDC next week. Last year, we announced HomeKit, and we've launched these products on the platform <laughs> since. It did take a, a longer time than I would have expected. Yeah, um, me too. Yeah. That thing's just been sitting there doing nothing on your phone for a year. Uh, but I, I imagine we're going to hear a lot more about this next Monday. Very probable. 
Ars Technica reports that Intel announced Thunderbolt 3 will use the USB Type-C connector instead of the mini display port connector. Thunderbolt 3 will, as you might expect, support USB 3.1, therefore uh, up to 10 gigabits per second. And Thunderbolt's transport layer will go up to 40 gigabits per second bidirectional full duplex. That means one Thunderbolt 3 cable can support two 4K displays or even a 5K display at 60 hertz. At launch, a passive Thunderbolt 3 cable that supports USB 3.1 and DisplayPort 1.2 at 20 gigabits per second will be sold, and an active cable that supports the 40 gigabits per second transport layer, but without the DisplayPort compatibility, uh, will also be sold. An active optical cable is coming sometime in 2016. The other two that I mentioned will ship before the end of this year. So that means that Thunderbolt will now be indistinguishable from from USB 3.1. I'm I'm wondering if this is going to lead to some confusion, and I guess I'm already somewhat confused. So yes, it will. But <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, it you will have a Thunderbolt uh, 3 connector where you will also be able to plug in USB cables. Right. I, I think the, conf the most confusion is going to come when somebody has a Thunderbolt device, let's say a display, right. and they plug it into a USB port and it doesn't work. Exactly. Because the USB port doesn't support Thunderbolt. Because Thunderbolt will support USB. Uh, it's, it seems like it's looking like all the cables will support USB 3.1, but not every USB port is going to support Thunderbolt. Although that's fixable, I guess. You know, it's just, it's just firmware. Because uh, it supports the connector, right? So uh, hopefully the confusion will be at a minimum, but there will be some cases out there where something's going to seem like it should work and it won't. Hmm. Yeah, hopefully but, uh, we'll honestly, have a small... I'm really excited about this. The USB Type-C connector, I think, is fantastic. And the fact that Thunderbolt and Intel is saying, we're, you know what, we're going to standardize on that, I think is great. Yeah, it's. I mean, it seems at this point that USB 3.1 has everything anyone should hope for in a in a connector. It could be the one to rule all of them. Now, if only Apple would <laughs> abandon the Lightning port that they launched what two years ago. Well, and go remember their USB last 3. their last MacBook had a USB C, C port. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, so, the, the, the MacBook, the new MacBook does, yeah, yeah. and it only has one. It's, yeah, it could be possible. I mean, there is no, apart from the fact that they wouldn't want to change, you know, they won't, wouldn't want to flip-flop um, and be flip-floppers, they could go to USB 3.1. It would be annoying for all the people that have uh, gotten uh, lightning connectors, but could make sense. Yeah. I guess maybe the well, but if they could, could they could continue to support Thunderbolt and Lightning, uh, and have a USB Type C connection. That's what this this allows. And if, if, for those who don't know, the USB Type C connection is the one that that's flippable. Speaking of flip flopping, like it doesn't matter which orientation you plug it in. It's and, and it's, it's tiny. Too. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, all the cables you have, you would need to get new cables if you have iOS devices. But. Yeah, Apple fans are kind of used to that. I guess so. Um, although there was a, a sizable uproar when uh, Apple let go of the very old 30-pin connector two years ago. Oh, I didn't and say there wouldn't pissed. be uproar. <laughs> ah, right, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, CNET reports that a Nintendo spokesman told the Wall Street Journal there is no truth to the report saying that we are planning to adopt Android for NX. Uh -huh. So it turns out Nikkei's people were not as familiar with the matter as they thought. Uh, Although, you know, the, um, the, the Polygon report on the matter uh, mentions that Nikkei, I'm quoting, Nikkei does have a long history of getting its reports correct, and Nintendo has a history of denying those reports early on, despite them being accurate. This is so, a really oh, I, flat denial, though. Like, yeah. there's denials and there's denials, right? There's mm -hmm. like, we have nothing to announce at this time, which is a really soft denial. And there's like, uh, we, we don't want to comment on rumors and speculation, all that. This is, there is no truth to the report. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, that's pretty so solid. If, if you want to get a little bit, uh, a, a little bit uh, annoyingly specific about it, they're saying there is no truth to the report that we are planning to adopt <laughs> Android for an X. So they might not be planning to do it, they but they might still it. be, or maybe they're studying different options with uh, Android being the one of them. Well, and or given maybe. Nikkei's track record, which you're absolutely right about, my guess is 
in the NX lab, somebody has a prototype of Android that they're playing around with to see uh, what it can do, and yet it's not on the roadmap. That that, that would fit be. these facts. If the, if somebody leaks out like, hey, they're developing with, with Android, and yet they're like, that's just an experiment. We have no plans to actually make that the product. Mm. Intel also announced updates to its 14 nanometer Broadwell fifth generation core processor lineup. According to CNET, five desktop and five mobile parts were announced. Uh, the Core i7-5950HQ for laptops is the most expensive one at 623 bucks. That gets you a 2.9 gigahertz quad core chip and apparently 95% better media performance than the previous i7-5600U, although at a cost of a 47 watt thermal design power rating. So it's a uh, quite a bit of an increase there. Uh, the Iris Pro 6200 graphics card is getting all the attention, though. That comes as a socketed desktop part with up to 128 megabytes of ED RAM, comparable to the GeForce 940M. Uh, they're also announced five new Xeon server chips, and those are getting the Iris Pro 6300 built in. So CPU geeks everywhere rejoice. Give your Our regards to Broadwell. <laughs> Ars Technica reports Gamefly announced it has acquired cloud gaming service Playcast and is using it to launch a Gamefly streaming service on Fire TV today. Gamefly streaming launches with 35 titles available in packs. The packs give unlimited play to 7 to 16 games ranging in price from $7 to $10 a month. Gamefly intends to refresh the games available and expand to other platforms. If you talk about your, this confuses me more than Thunderbolt 3 and USB Type-C does. Uh, so I can buy packs per month. So I can have multiple subscriptions per month to packs yeah. of games that so won't change. Think of it like a satellite TV or cable TV plan. Oh, like bundles. I yeah, it's basically bundles. And it might seem like a bad way of doing it because you have to pay for multiple packs or probably you're going to want some Yeah, man, because I can go to Sony. Packs. I just pay them one amount a month and I get all the games. That is very true, uh, but these can be cheaper. You know, Sony is, if you pay for it for three months, it uh, it gets you, uh, it, it comes down to 15 bucks a month. Uh, this could be seven, so you could get some games. Yeah, it's not that... I'm guessing it's probably not going to be for very hardcore gamers, but I guess it's interesting that they're trying a different uh, monetization with this uh, idea of cloud gaming because we haven't yet found... There isn't a lot of competition. This is sort of a new um, field, and it there could be something there. I think seven is probably a little bit too expensive because, as you correctly said, uh, Sony has a more all-encompassing uh, offering. But if you come down, let's say, a couple of bucks, if you have, let's say, 10 games for 5 bucks a month, could be interesting for some people, maybe. Yeah, and so far the games are not blowing me away. If you're a Lego fan, they've mm -hmm. got a Lego pack, and I can see where the, that bundled approach for might kids, work. Maybe for particular fans, right? They're going to be excited to get, oh, I can get, you know, Lego Batman, Lego Hobbit, Lego Gotham, uh, Lego Beyond Gotham. But then there's a racing game, and I am I like racing games, and I'm looking at this, I'm like, Grid 2, MotoGP 13. I, you know, well, yeah, I, guess, I mean, I don't know. Maybe mm. it's because I have a console. If I didn't have a console, and this was my only access, I might be more excited. Yeah, I guess that's that is the the idea. I mean, there are there are some interesting games. There's uh, Batman, uh, you know, Arkham. This is City or Asylum, might be City. Uh, Fear Three, Dirt Three. They're they're serious games. Um, yeah. They're it's not like the you know I don't know the Ouya or things like that where the games weren't as compelling. True. These are, no, that's a very good point. So, uh, however you look at it, though, Alicia Keys said it best: "This game flies on fire." <laughs> TV. Wired reports that Facebook will open a new artificial intelligence lab in Paris, where you're usually at. Uh, the head of AI for Facebook, Jan LeCun, was born and educated in Paris and says he wants to work openly with and invest in the AI research community in Europe. LeCun specializes in deep learning and building computers that mimic the human brain's neural network. Facebook already uses deep learning to identify images on the site. And uh, don't forget, Google owns a deep learning outfit called DeepMind in Oxford, England. So it looks like all the U.S. money is coming to Europe to invest in AI research. Yeah, maybe not 
all of it, uh, but <laughs> some of it. It's interesting, them. you know. It, we're at least in in Paris. Uh, the French are usually bemoaning the fact that we are not attractive to entrepreneurs, and the the job market or the economic contest uh, context is not attractive. Yet, uh, probably for geographical reasons and a bunch of others. All of the big tech companies have offices in Paris, and uh, this is one other example of that. So I'm not sure what to make of it, but it's definitely interesting. And, and I'm also happy that Facebook is investing in, in Europe and Paris, but it's, um, again, interesting that they're doing that at a time when uh, Europe is not maybe not very happy with the way those tech giants handle taxes and data and things like that. Oh, so, that so you think there's another to... motivation of like, hey, you know, we're employing all these people now in AI research. Wouldn't want well, the it wouldn't to hurt, go away, yeah. would you? Mm, it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> the Verge Report's SoundHound founder, Kevin Mohair, has launched an Android app called Hound. The app is a natural language processor that handles complex questions and answers them fast. Hound does speech recognition and understanding in the same engine. Hey, Tom, what is the population of the capital of the country in which the Space Needle is located? Huh? Okay, Too so late. Hound already has the answer. The population of Washington, D.C. is 601,723 precisely. And that, that is an example uh, of one of the questions they did in a demo for The Verge. And, uh, you know, they were impressive because what is the population of the capital of the country in which the Space Needle is located means you have to deal with two Washingtons. You have to know the Space Needle is in Washington, but the capital of that country that Washington is in is also called Washington, but it's a different Washington, Washington, D.C., and then be able to look up the population and spit that answer out, which is very impressive. And, and the fact that it is speech recognition and understanding in the same engine is one of the reasons it's able to do things fast, but just able to tease out the complexity of natural language like that is fairly impressive. Now, this app is available for Android users of phones. I couldn't put it on my tablet. It was like, nope, can't put it on a Nexus 9. Uh, so I'm curious how it works in practice. It also isn't integrated into anything yet, right? But that's, that's what Hound wants. They're like, we want people to see how good this is and then put it in their apps and hopefully put it in their platforms as well. Well, Tom, I don't know how people are educated in the U.S., but for me, it was a relatively easy question, and I understood the thing about the country or state in, you know, at maximum uh, 15 seconds. So it's not that big. Well, you, ha you have the advantage of uh, the evolved natural language processor of your brain. How do you uh, have that? that that's too complex for me to understand. Let's move on. The next web reports BQ has announced the Aquarius E5 HD Ubuntu edition. That's its second smartphone to replace Android with Ubuntu. It's a 5-inch 720p display dual SIM, 1 gigabyte of RAM, quad-core processor, 16 gigabytes of storage phone. The rear camera is 13 megapixels, too. It's expected to arrive mid-June, unlocked for 199 euros and 90 euro cents across all of Euroland. <laughs> I love the addition of two euros in the sentence. Well played. Thank you. Mashable reports that Pinterest showed off mock action buttons that will let users buy products directly from the site and add items to a wish list. So if you see a recipe on Pinterest and want all the ingredients, you could add those ingredients in your cart with one click. Pinterest's head of partnerships, Tim Kendall, Tim Kendall uh, said Pinterest hasn't built the feature yet. No. Oh. It, it's an interesting one, though. It's a, it, there are so many opportunities for Pinterest to monetize. This would seem like a pretty obvious one. It's, it reminds me of the same impulse uh, behind the Google uh, tap right? Which is like, I'm in context, so I want to do something. This is much less sophisticated than that because it doesn't have to interpret what's on the page. You mean, um, you mean uh, Google Now on tap? or? Yeah, yeah, Google Now on oh, tap. Right. Uh, so, so yes, I'm not comparing the technologies, but it's that same impulse on the user side, which is I just want to do the thing that I'm looking at. And, and in Pinterest, a lot of times, I mean, people shop. And if there's a buy button there, that they can just buy the thing they're looking at, uh, Pinterest is going to make some money off that. So are retailers. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, definitely.
Time for some news from you. Uh, a, lo a lot of our news, tons of our news. The Wonderlist uh, story, for instance, comes off of our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com, and you uh, don't get to complain unless you vote. So if you're like, wait a minute, why didn't you cover my favorite story of the day? Well, get into dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and make your voice heard. Now, you're not the only voice, so we have to pay attention to a lot of things. And we also put our own spin on it. That's why we're here, is to, to craft the perspective. But it is very important and very helpful to see what the subreddit thinks is important. And the more people that participate, the more helpful it is. Uh, thank you, our patentee, for submitting, uh, our patentee, I should say, submitting this one. Uh, you guys voted it up. PC World reports on a product called Batterizer, which claims to extend the life of disposable batteries by around 800%. It's essentially a scaled down voltage booster that keeps batteries alive. Even when they drop below 1.5 volts of output, they can actually keep them alive all the way down to 0.6 volts. Uh, the sleeve that goes around the battery is 0.1 millimeters thick. So the batteries can fit in pretty much any standard compartment. Batterizer is going to launch on an Indiegogo campaign in June, and then they intend to sell the product in September for $10 for a pack of four. Nice. T Glass 1976 sent us the dis disturbing news. I'm disturbed that Hot Topic seems to have been outbid <gasps> in its purchase of Think Geek. Yes, hold your hold your comments for just a, more, a second. Ars Technica reports GameStop swooped in <gasps> and offered twenty dollars a share. Wait, wait, it's not over. Stealing the deal away from Hot Topic. GeekNet, ThinkGeek's parent company, has formally accepted GameStop's offer. So if you were hoping for a last-minute reversal, apparently it didn't, didn't happen. Although, the deal should conclude sometime in August. Unless... We should you buy know, it. Can you think we? we can come up with $21 a share? Uh, how many shares? Is it more than three? A lot three? of shares. Okay, it's if it's more than more three, then it might be a little bit difficult. But if it isn't, we have a shot. So... Um, Look, Think Geek and Hot Topic made perfect sense to me. Uh, it's basically, you know, Hot Topic was saying, we just want to be the physical world equivalent of Think Geek. And that made a lot of sense. GameStop, this is genius. GameStop's been doing all the right things in advance of saying, oh, you know what? Games are going to all be bought online in the future. Instead of folding in advance of that, like bookstores, uh, let's figure out how to keep the people who come into our stores coming into our stores to buy other things. Uh, so they've been, you know, they've been starting online services, which is smart. But this would be brilliant. Start become the Think Geek store. Become the place where gamers shop for the things that they would like to buy in person immediately. Accessories, shirts, fun little toys. Yeah, genius. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And that is a look at the headlines. All right, let's uh, talk about a story that caught Patrick's eye today. TechCrunch's Sarah Perez reporting that the App Store made a change, the iOS App Store made a change May 14th in the U.S. market that took away the new What's Hot and All iPhone algorithmically determined sections of the games page on the App Store and replaced it with mostly editorially curated lists. Games now has best new games, chosen by editors, best new updates, chosen by editors, and on subcategories, all-time greats. There is one algorithmically determined category still there called more games you might like. That's based on your individual history there, so it's more relevant to you. I also saw best new updates as well. Uh, first time games subcategories have ever had curated lists. They've had featured lists and theme lists on the main page, but never on the subcategories. Uh, different categories have different lists in the App Store, Patrick. A lot of developers, though, are complaining that their sales have tanked because of this. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, consequence of that change. Um, the I suspect that the sales might be a, a, a temporary effect, the sales tanking. Um, I would suspect that before, the, the, the algorithm wouldn't necessarily be easy to, to game. Huh? Huh? Ah, I see what you did there. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it took you a second. Um, but, you know, the algorithms are always uh, possible and probably easy, well, actually easier to game than uh, just the curation. So it might be that some of those titles were just trying to game the system or maybe they're just not appearing anymore because they're not the ones that the teams at Apple have uh, chosen uh, to display. Um, 
so there might be some time to adapt, but the fact is it was providing a somewhat poor experience, uh, in my opinion, when you only had algorithmically selected titles and apps. And it is a little bit more work to have um, the, the games selected by team, but they already do that in some other portions of the store, on podcasts, on other uh, things, and there's really no reason for games to not be in that, uh, in that same boat. One of the really interesting aspects of it, though, is that it allows Apple to sort of influence the type of content that they will have on their store. Um, this might be seen as a nefarious, uh, something that could be used, you know, power that could be used for evil. Um, in this case, all of the games that are in the little carousel at the top that doesn't appear, so you have lots of different categories in the App Store, and when they're algorithmically created, you don't have a small carousel at the top. It's just a very ugly um, banner that doesn't represent anything really. When they are curated, you have a, a, a carousel that displays a bunch of titles. In this case, at least in France, um, all of the titles selected are titles uh, that you have to pay. Maybe all but one uh, are titles you have to pay for. They're not uh, freemium games. Um, so they're not free-to-play games. So I'm wondering if this isn't a way for Apple to try and give a, a, a little nudge, a little hint to developers saying what we value are games that you pay once for and you don't, you're not going to be pestered with um, lots of suggestions and reminders and opportunities to pay more or pay something for the game. That it because we've discussed it a few times. It seems those free-to-play games have sort of taken over um, the entire economy of of the app store, especially for games, which is a huge, very important portion of that store. So, essentially, what I'm saying is, uh, this curation gives Apple the power to steer the app store's boat when uh, algorithm didn't necessarily as much. Well, it gives them the chance to steer it even more than they already did. I mean, I, it's I one of the so, most yes. locked down app stores in existence. Mm -hmm. So they've been steering for a long time. They just took over more of the direction. Now, some devs reporting drops of 30 to 90% of their sales. Granted, I'm sure when you change the listings, the people who are no longer in the listings are going to see their, their sales drop. That's doesn't matter how you change them. That's going to happen. What I bet didn't happen is an overall drop in app sales. Uh, that, that Apple wouldn't do that because that would hurt them and it would, it would mean less money for them and their developers overall. So I'm going to say without knowing for sure that I'm certain this has not hurt developers in aggregate, that it has helped in, uh, developers in aggregate. However, it may have hurt small developers harder uh, because Apple can decide to choose the partners that it's more familiar with, which could be bigger developers. And that, that could be a valid uh, problem with this. But at the same time, instead of having to game a system, as you were saying, a developer has to now impress the Apple editorial board. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a different method here. It's still, to me, not the ideal system, though, because what should happen is the thing that impresses people who play games uh, should be what is surfaced and, and featured. And I, I don't know if there's a, a dead-on way to do that yet. It, yeah, it's definitely a, a difficult problem because uh, theoretically, if you put the games, uh, if you, you put forward the games that have been selling the most or making the most money, which was the old system, you would, you know, come up with a list where the most successful games are presented to, to the potential buyers. Um, in effect, even if that was the case, there were effects that wouldn't necessarily be desirable, like games that were the most efficient are uh, at tricking people into spending money Correct. would get, uh, or even without going that far, games that would have the kind that would elicit the kind of behavior you don't necessarily want associated with your game with your store, like. Uh, you know, somewhat addictive behavior. You know, the the 
free-to-play market has become more and more worrisome to game developers in the past year or 18 months. Um, there have been a few reports of um, g uh, mobile games conferences where there were, you know, developers, of course, but also uh, a lot of people that were dealing in, um, in gambling. And those kinds of sites that were very interested. Well, Apple can in, take care of that by games. just banning gambling apps, though. They don't no, no, that's not to, no, no. to curate the store. Well, that's the thing. It's not gambling apps. It's games that have uh, freemium and free-to-play uh, elements, but that rely on uh, player behaviors and gaming well, that's mechanics. That's what I'm saying, though. Apple could that, just ban those kinds of apps. I don't they think really they could. They really don't want to be associated with those kinds of apps. I don't think they could quite in that way because they're they're almost they constitute a huge amount of the um, gaming apps market now. They they become so well, huge. But if I don't you're think gonna, if you're quite... trying to curate them out of existence, why not just go the rest of the way? You're basically well, saying I don't want them to be successful either way. Well, I don't. That's the thing. I don't think that's neither Apple wants nor desirable. I think it's about balance. Hmm. So in other words, they don't want to rid the world of them. They just don't want to highlight them. Uh, and, and they get this. This is a very Apple maneuver, right? They get more control over the App Store. Makes perfect sense to me. Oh, did we lose Patrick? I thought he was just being unusually reticent. Uh, but he, he seems to have frozen up there. Uh -oh. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get him back. Don't worry. Uh, but that, that was pretty much uh, the wrap up of that conversation. Uh, so uh, apps reported uh, January, the App Store had 1.4 million apps. Uh, and I bet at WWDC next week, we're going to hear even more. Let's move on to our pick of the day. Uh, it was sent to us by Matt. Uh, had a discussion with Darren on Friday, if you remember, regarding trusting Google with your passwords as well as cyber attacks from North Korea. Uh, Matt says, I always find the security and cybercrime topics on the show entertaining, and this latest one prompted me to start reading a book that has been on my reading list since it came out in February. The book is Future Crimes by Mark Goodman. I don't think it's the same Mark Goodman that was on MTV. The book covers a wide range of topics from our oversharing of personal information, the motives of the companies we give that info to and how they use it, the technology used in both cyber attacks and terrorist attacks, such as the Mumbai attacks in 2008, and the future possibilities of technology-centered crimes around the world. It is a lengthy book, but totally enthralling. And Matt says, I highly recommend it for any tech, cybercrime, or security fan, junkie enthusiast, conspiracist, Luddite, or otherwise. Uh, you can find uh, the pick uh, at bookstores everywhere. So check it out. Future Crimes by Mark Goodman. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Got some emails too. Uh, Juice wrote in regarding our discussion on Monday about uh, Facebook and the news. Uh, Juice says, I just wrote a short research paper for my honors on paywalls. The newspaper Paywall, a suboptimal payment model that distinguishes that diminishes public access to quality journalism. And, and Juice says, yeah, it's an academic wank title. It's meant to be. Uh, but here's a section of it regarding a social danger. Readers who are paying per article try to only read articles that they agree with rather than items that will challenge their worldview. Uh, and there's a quote referring to individuals who had to pay for news in a study were significantly less likely to select stories from an opinion challenging source than individuals who did not have to pay for news. I also highly recommend Matthew Ingram, now with Fortune, after the sudden demise of GigaOM, and Jeff Jarvis, mostly on Medium, but also on This Week in Google, on these subjects. I'm sure that's not news to you, those recommendations, says Juice. But yeah, uh, that is that is a great, a great, great point there uh, that when you have paywalls, you're going to have a selection bias involved there. And uh, Facebook doesn't have a paywall. So you actually do have some freedom inside of Facebook to pick the kinds of things that you may or may not agree with. Uh, we also got L. Watt Commander, aka David the Programmer in Florida, uh, from tropical South Florida, saying, your story on news sources and which are trusted was very good. Being barely a Gen Xer, I found that I really do not match my demographic at all. 
What the study seemed to miss, in my opinion, is that Facebook tends to expose people to the extremes in news far more than traditional news stories. Sure, people on Facebook think they are being exposed to different viewpoints, but as Veronica pointed out, they are just being exposed to things that are so far from their worldview that they are easy to dismiss. That's a fair uh, piece of criticism as well. I think a lot of people, when you hear a study, want to say, well, I'm not like that. So that part of his reaction is not unusual. Everybody everybody says that because the study is an average and none of us are, are exact replications of the average. But the idea that on Facebook you might see more extreme examples of journalism far to one side or the other of an issue, I think is a very interesting and, 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 and frankly, uh, a, a premise that should be explored and find out if people, when they expose themselves to viewpoints different than their own, tend to expose themselves to more extreme viewpoints that they can then not be swayed by. Hello. Oh, hello. Patrick is back. I, uh, uh, so apparently the internet blew up at the house. That was going to happen. We knew that uh, was going to happen. And at least it happened at the end of our conversation. Did you get the, the last of my uh, sentence? Maybe. Yes, I got the last of your sentence and I was responding. And then you were very All quiet right. in response. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's not like so Patrick. Got- he usually is quick with the like, nah, yes, but here's the other point. That's what I like. Well, uh, and then I looked and I'm like, oh, from- he's also being very still. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we had a problem with the connection. But it's good to have you back. We were just uh, going through some things about the Facebook algorithm story that we had yesterday. I've got one more from Claudia who talks about how during Dilma Rousseff's election, there were a bunch of protests. Uh, she was disagreeing with a lot of people about their viewpoints. Some were saying they should bring back the dictatorship in Brazil. So she unfriended a bunch of people. Uh, and she said, since, uh, uh, since I did that, I banished them to my acquaintance list and their posts have disappeared. I have not seen any conservative posts in my wall except for those posted or shared by my mother. I believe that feed filtering is real and a real danger. We surround ourselves only with the news we want to hear, with the points of view we agree with, and that validate those points of views with other people's arguments and creates a feedback loop. So we've got three different responses here. One, basically saying, you know, the real problem isn't on Facebook, it's on paywalls. Paywalls are the thing that make you only want to read stuff you want to hear. And then we have Elwok Commander saying, oh, no, no, you you see things on Facebook that you don't want to hear, but you see the extremes, so you just dismiss them. And then Claudia saying, well, you hear other viewpoints until it gets really serious and then you dismiss them all and that's a danger as well Hmm. Uh, you know it's it's a very difficult thing i think we actually need some very serious academic uh, academic research on this it's it's risen to a point where uh, yesterday you were saying that you know if that ends up influencing an election i don't think you know um Facebook would ever actually do this, but it could become a, 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 an important, powerful factor in shaping people's viewpoints, and maybe we would need some, yeah, some academic, serious, reliable research on the topic, because for now, the only thing we have is people saying, that's how it influences me, or that's how it doesn't. And that is very circumstantial. And we got more than a few people writing in saying, yeah, exactly. You need to watch this because Mark Zuckerberg is in the pocket of the candidate I disagree with. And so he's going to spin the election towards that person. Thing is, all those people named a different person on a different point in the political spectrum all the way from the left to the extreme right. So uh, I'm not sure anyone's very clear on whose pocket Mark Zuckerberg might be in. But if he were, he could have an effect, one would think. Yep. Uh, Jeff from Waterlogged Boston had a quick note on the Windows 10 notification Microsoft pushed to Windows 7 users the other day. It's created a lot of work and undue stress for those in the position to support Windows 7 users. What's this icon? Do I have a virus? Have been asked to myself and my peers constantly since KB3035583 got pushed down. I've been told Windows 7 Enterprise Edition users were spared the notification, but my opinion is that all machines running the Pro Edition should have been excluded as well. I'm glad Microsoft is making the upgrade path easy and straightforward for home users, but they need to be more sensitive to small and medium-sized businesses who will have their own deployment schedule and user training for Windows 10. All right. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. But I think it, there is, you know, good and bad sides to everything. The, the upside of forcing, quote-unquote, forcing a lot of people to see the possibility of upgrading, the, the upgrade path, 
outweighs the 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 small annoyances that he's uh, mentioning. I, you know, in my opinion, it's better if in a couple of years we have as many people as possible on the same platform and version of Windows. I assumed it was all about load balancing to be like, all right, these are the number of people in this order that are going to get the upgrade pushed to them because they reserved it ahead of time. We'll see how this I'm, I'm starting to think this is going to be a bit of a nightmare at the mm. end of July. Possibly. Well, thank you, Patrick Beja, for joining us. As always, uh, when you're not traipsing around Finland, actually, even when you are traipsing around Finland, you're doing lots of other podcasts. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm going to be in Finland for a few weeks, and uh, the connection at the uh, home where I will be is going to be better than this one. So, <laughs> don't you know? I'll, I'll be able to uh, wait because you're going to be farther out in the country. Exactly. You're going to have better bandwidth. So basically, I'm at my mother-in-law's house right now, and she really doesn't care about the internet, so she didn't, oh, okay. you know, that's why. But yeah. at the house I'm going to be for a few weeks, I made damn sure that there was an excellent connection, and I'm going to have a backup, uh, a backup uh, mobile connection, uh, 4G mobile connection, so... Awesome. And yes, I have a lot of cool things going on, and all of them are at frenchspin.com. You can find a show about gaming called Pixels, and you can find a show about international fun and news with people from different countries around the world uh, giving their opinions and uh, thoughts on uh, topics that we think we might have figured out out and that show is called the Phileas Club. Both of them have had new episodes in the past few days so you can go to frenchspin.com and enjoy both. Enjoy them. I actually really enjoyed the last Phileas Club. I'm glad you had two Middle Eastern uh, residents because you got to see the difference in the way they, they view certain things. That was really that was really enlightening. Yeah, yeah, that was the idea. You know, we, as I said in the show, I often um, invite two Europeans on the show, but for some reason I thought, well, you know, Arab countries, I have one. They're covered. The entirety of the Middle East is covered. So, yeah, I figured that could be good, and, and it was. It was a very fun show. So Check it out, frenchpin.com. Also check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash acedetect, and join the 5,051 people who are making this show possible for you to listen to. Or if you are one of those people, thank you very much for making the show possible. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support has all the different ways you can support the show. Our email address is feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. You can give us a call 512-59-DAILY. It's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live at AlphaGeekRadio.com and visit our website, DailyTechNewsShow.com. Claudia was saying that I swallow the show sometimes. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with Scott Johnson and Dr. Lisha Zhang about name-directed networks. Talk to you then. The show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>